Okay, so the question I want to consider is the following. Scientist says that there's this ether that fills whole space. So I'm going to draw the ether just as some dot. Okay? So there's the ether. We don't know what it is, right? So it's just blue dots. Now, if the ether is stationary, so the ether is not moving, then the speed of light should be the same in all directions. Right? So if the ether is stationary in space, then the speed of light should be c, the same speed in all directions. Right? In the same way that in this room the air is stationary and the speed of sound is the same in all directions. So stationary. In the stationary ether, the speed of sound is the speed of light, sorry, is the same in all directions. Now, imagine that the ether is moving. So imagine that the ether is moving this way with a certain speed, which I'll call u. So this is the ether velocity. Okay. So now my little ether particles are flowing this way in space. Now, in this case, the speed of light will not be the same in all directions. Right? When the light is flowing with the ether, it will go a little bit faster. Right? So, in this case, the speed will be c plus u. Right? Just add the ether speed to the speed of light if they're going in the same direction. When they're going in the opposite direction, the speed should be c minus u. Right? So it goes faster in the direction of the ether and slower in the opposite direction. Right? Now the thing I want to calculate, which, I mean, it's not too difficult, but takes a little bit of calculation, is what's going to be the speed of light in other directions. So for example, what's going to be the speed of light if I'm going perpendicular like this? So the answer, by the way, is not C. Lots of people assume that the speed of light doesn't change in this direction. That's not true. So that's what I want to calculate now. Right, so in order to calculate this, we need something which is known as a Galilean transformation. So let me explain what does a Galilean transformation mean. Okay. So the Galilean transformation is an attempt to ask, answer the following question. Suppose I've got an observer here, okay, and this observer has some coordinates, which you can call x and t. He measures space and time. Okay, and he is trying to measure the space, position, and time of a certain event. Okay. So he's watching something, and he says this thing is occurring at position x at time t. It doesn't matter what it is. Right. So how does he measure that? Well, in order to measure the spatial position of this thing, he needs to have some apparatus to measure space. Okay. So we can give him a ruler. Right? And he can use his ruler to measure the position. Right? In order to measure the time at which something happens, he needs to have some apparatus to measure time, so we'll give him a clock as well. So this observer has a clock to measure the time of something and a ruler to measure the position of something. Okay. Now, the question we want to ask is, answer is the following. Suppose I've got another observer here who has the same setup, so he's also got a ruler. And he's also got a clock. Okay. But the second observer is moving <coughs> in this direction with a speed u. Okay? So I'll, I'll do this okay. So 
two observers, but the difference between them is they, one of them is moving relative to the other. Okay. Now, if this observer we call S, he measures coordinates X with this ruler here and time T with his clock, then this observer, which is usually called S prime for some reason, he will measure a different position, right, because he's moving. So he will measure a position X prime and he will measure a time T prime. <coughs> okay, so let me write something about that. And the question I want to ans answer is what position and time x prime t prime is measured by the other observer s prime. So this event, it doesn't matter what it is. Just something happens over there. Okay? And both observers measure the position at which it happens and the time at which it happens. So in order to answer this question, we need to make some assumptions. The first assumption we, we make is that at time zero, the clocks are synchronized. Okay? So at time zero, the clocks start at the same point. Okay. So the first thing you assume is that at t equals zero, t prime also equals zero. So they, they agree on zero. Okay? And we make the same assumption about x. So we assume that at x equals zero, x prime equals zero. So at this particular point, both observers agree. Which we can just set at the zero point. So that's more or less a definition. Okay? So that's the first thing we assume. Now, we can answer the question. So the second thing we assume, and this is an assumption, which we'll talk a lot about later on, is that if the clocks start off ticking at the same time, so they agree on zero, then they keep ticking at the same time. So in other words, if the clocks are synchronized at this particular point, then they stay synchronized. Okay? So if this, if this clock, this is S's clock, this is S prime's clock, right? If this clock measures 10 seconds, then this clock also measures 10 seconds. We assume. Okay. So we assume okay, that T equals T prime for all times. So in other words, the two observers agree upon the measurement of time. Okay. So then, the only thing we have to say, so we've said that t prime is just the same as t, the only thing we have to answer then is what's x prime? And this is also easy to answer. So at the time t, Here's the first observer, S, with his ruler. Okay. Here's my event. Okay. He measures position X here. At time T, the second observer will have moved. Right? Because the second observer here is moving in this direction. So at time zero, they start off together. At time T, he will have moved. Right? And in particular, the amount he will have moved Here's S prime. He's got a ruler. Okay. He is measuring coordinate X prime. How far will he have moved? He will have moved a, an amount U times T. Right? U is his velocity, T is the amount of time, so that's how far he's moved. So therefore, just by comparing the distances, this distance here is x, this distance here is u minus t, so therefore, okay, so I haven't drawn it quite right. So we should really draw it from the start of the ruler, right? This distance here is ut, this distance here is x prime, this distance here is x, right? So therefore, we can write down x prime is equal to x minus u times t. Okay? Dead easy, right? And we've already said the times stay the same. So we have these two equations 
that relate the coordinates of one observer to the coordinates of another, okay, when they've got a constant relative velocity between them. And it's these equations which are known as the Galilean transformation. Now, how does this Galilean transformation help us to answer this question here? Okay. So the obvious answer is that if my observer S prime sees this, sees the stationary ether, then the observer S will see that. Right? So therefore, this can be the S prime picture here, and this is the S picture. So provided we know how to relate velocities between S prime and S, then we can answer this question here. Is that clear? Maybe. Let me just say it again, because it's quite important. So imagine, this is a stationary ether, right? And imagine that this is what the S prime observer sees as he's moving. So if he sees a stationary ether, then the S observer must see the ether moving with the S prime observer. So he, S observer will see the ether moving like this. So we can relate the velocities by relating the measurements of these two observers. So let's do that. Okay, so what does the Galilean transformation imply for the measurement of velocities? So, the S prime observer measures, so S prime is now watching something move, and he measures the velocity V prime. Okay. So, velocity is just the derivative of position with respect to time in his coordinates. Right? That's by definition. Now we can put in the Galilean transformation here. GT, I'm going to use Galilean transformation. Right? So if you put in the results of the Galilean transformation, T prime is the same as T. So D by DT prime is the same as D by DT. Time measurement is the same. And X prime, we've written down there, is X minus U times T. Okay? Now, U is a constant. Right? It doesn't depend upon time. So therefore, D by DT of U times T is just u, right? So this is equal to dx by dt minus u, right? But this is just the velocity measured by the S observer. So what we conclude from all this, very simply, is that the velocity measured by the S prime observer is equal to the velocity measured by the S observer minus the relative velocity between them. So that's the Galilean transformation of velocities. Okay? Right, so what does this mean for light? So, if S prime observer sees a stationary ether, Okay, and I'll just look at the, the case of light going up, yeah. So the S prime observer sees a stationary ether, let's assume. He therefore sees light moving at the speed C. Okay. Then what does the S prime observer see? Sorry, what does the S observer see? He sees the ether moving this way. Oh, tell man, I need you. Sorry, that's not... I mean, it's not wrong, but that's not the question I wanted to answer. So. That's the ether. The question I wanted to answer is, suppose that the S observer sees light going vertically up, right? Then this light will have a certain speed which we can call V, and that's the thing we want to find. Okay? Now, what does the S prime observer see, right? Well, according to this formula, V prime 
is equal to V minus U. Okay? So therefore, he will see light going in a direction like this. And we can make a triangle out of this, like this, and this. And this vector here is the vector V. This is the speed of light measured here. And this vector here is the vector minus U. So that's the result of this transformation here, right? V minus U. Okay? Now we know that in S prime frame, the ether is stationary, so therefore the light is traveling at a constant speed C. Right? Because if the ether is stationary, light is traveling at speed C. So therefore, we get a nice triangle which looks like this. This is V, this is U, and this is C. Okay? This is a right angle. So therefore, we can conclude that V is equal to Pythagoras' theorem, square root of C squared minus U squared. Okay, so that answers the question, right? What speed of light do you measure in this case when the ether is moving? Well, you measure a speed, square root, C squared minus U squared. So this observer with the moving ether will measure speed C plus U parallel to the ether, C minus U anti-parallel to the ether, and then this speed at 90 degrees to the ether. Right. Okay, and th this result is going to be important um, for the, the experiments I want to describe to you now. So... <coughs> 